Today, the impossible question, health or wealth? The DFA Daily to 22nd of June 2020. Hello again, I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to the latest post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour and a touch of philosophy on the side. In today's post, we consider the dilemma at the heart of the COVID crisis, which is essentially a trade-off between health or wealth, which is most important. And before we start, a quick reminder that tomorrow on the 23rd of June at 8pm Sydney time, you can join us live for a discussion on bank regulation and what needs to change with our guest, Robbie Barwick from the Citizens Party. This is actually perfect timing as the Senate is inquiring into a proposed change which would outlaw bank deposit bail-in and submissions close in just a couple of weeks. And I discussed this issue with John Adams on the Interests of the People channel if you want more information. Now, the financial standard today said that Victoria was primed and pumped for the second stage of looser coronavirus restrictions after the clock struck midnight on the 22nd of June. But instead, it turned into a reverse Cinderella story. Now from midnight Sunday, planned easing of restrictions for restaurants and pubs and limits on household and public gatherings were suspended, some even tightened, until midnight on July the 12th. The Andrews government was forced into this after 19 new cases were reported on the eve of the planned reopening. The 19 new infections followed reported infection of 25, 13, 18 and 21 over the past four days. For sure and for certain, the Victorian government and other Australian state governments and other world governments have the welfare of their respective economies and constituents in mind, much more than central banks trying to strike a balance between unemployment and inflation, the coronavirus presents policymakers a chicken and egg dilemma. Health before wealth, or vice versa. Wealth before health. This is underscored by Australian Industry Group's Chief Executive Innes Willick's statement that it is crucial that nationally our economy is able to open as far as possible to drive business and consumer confidence. We can't afford to shut again an already deeply struggling national economy because of localised COVID-19 outbreaks. Health before wealth, Australian Medical Association AMA President Tony Bartoni warned that any continued uptick from here and the risk of a second wave is absolutely a live possibility. The virus is still prevalent in the community. It still wants to spread. It needs to be treated with absolute respect. Whether it's restriction fatigue, whether it's something else, but clearly people have started to disregard those messages and we're seeing the results in the number of case reports. Now, both these are valid points. And so has other states, particularly Western Australia and South Australia, to keep their borders closed despite the federal government's coaxing. The coronavirus doesn't and won't respect state borders. There might not be any reported virus infection in the Australian Capital Territory, the Northern Territory, South Australia and Queensland over the past 24 hours, but the one reported case in Western Australia, five cases in New South Wales, and more specifically the 19 in Victoria, could easily multiply if allowed to cross borders. One state giving all it's got to control the virus, health before wealth, while its neighbouring state relaxes restrictions in the interest of business interests, wealth before health, provides a toxic recipe of fresh infections for both states. Now, the ABC says that former Treasurer Peter Costello says that the Australian government debt could hit a trillion dollars because of the coronavirus crisis. And it would be very unlikely to be paid back. I don't think you'd pay back a trillion dollars, Mr Costello said. You can't pay back any of it until you turn a budget surplus. That's the first point. And then how many budget surpluses would you need to pay that back? 20? 20 in a row? Can you imagine that? At the start of the crisis, the federal government had more than $570 billion of debt, more than five times what it got to after the global financial crisis. The coronavirus has plunged the global economy into its most severe recession in 90 years. 
That is, if we're lucky, according to Ros Garnaud, professor of economics at the University of Melbourne, who spent the past five months researching what the virus is doing to the Australian economy. It's triggered a deep recession. If we're lucky, it will simply be the deepest recession since the Great Depression. I think that we'll be remembering the pandemic recession after we've stopped thinking a lot about the pandemic itself. It's a recession that's going to be very difficult for Australia, no matter how well we continue to do with the virus. And we've done very well so far because of the massive effect it's having on the global economy and on our major trading partners. As Mr. Costello puts it, just as we get the patients out of the ICU, we get the economy into the ICU. That's where it is at the moment. There's, the recession will be sharpened by the fact that household economic pressures are already growing and people are already struggling before the pandemic. Digital finance analytics data shared exclusively with 730 shows rental stress and unoccupied mortgage stress has been rising at a fairly steady rate since the global financial crisis. The data, measured by a cash flow analysis of 52,000 people, shows that 35.6% of rental households were experiencing rental stress in December 2019, more than double that in December 2000, when it was at 16.3%. And known occupied households experiencing mortgage stress was at 32.7% in December 2019, while in December 2000, it was 11.7%. Marley Baker, Managing Director of Bendigo and Adelaide Bank, said out of her 1.86 million customers, about 20,000 mortgage and business customers had deferred their loan repayments. I think from an industry perspective, around $220 billion worth of loans are currently having their interest payments deferred and principal payments deferred, she said. And Melbourne's iconic Queen Victoria market is a microcosm of the big economy recovery problem. For industries that rely on the gathering of people and tourism in particular, the recovery is going to be slow and tough. The market was there for Australia's first depression in 1891, as well as the second one in the 1930s, the Spanish flu, two world wars and a global financial crisis, but it has never seen the likes of this. We've been trading here continually for 70 years. Nobody has experienced anything like this before, Belinda Dougherty from the American Donut Kitchen said. We've seen a steep decline in our revenue. Wendy Voon of Wendy Voon Knits said, we've seen pretty good foot traffic become non-existent. And fruit seller Rosa Ansaldo said, 2020 has been a very challenging year between the fires, the floods, the drought. It's been the toughest year and I can't wait for it to finish. Fishmonger George Malanus said when his revenue dropped by about 50%, it was panic stations. It was about two weeks of absolute panic. It really was, he said. We are all extremely worried. We're getting a lot of support in the back end at Queen Victoria Market. I'm not sure what's happening elsewhere, he said. Mr Malanus is worried about what will happen come September, when many financial support measures are slated to end. And Greg Combe says Australians cannot afford to have financial assistance measures finished in September. Many are concerned that schemes like JobKeeper and JobSeeker, bank loan deferrals and rent relief all assume the downturn will end in September. We cannot afford, once we get through to September, to have measures conclude, Greg Combo, Industry Super Australia Chair and Member of the Government's National COVID-19 Coordination Commission said, having said that, I think we've also got to shift from the focus on income support to promotion of productive investment in the economy. Some businesses will simply not survive, Mr Costello said. They're not going to survive the ICU. They're just never coming back. And that means our economy will be weaker longer. The real cure for the economy's woes is a coronavirus vaccine. And no one knows how far that is, if one will be found at all. I think it will be hard for us to go back to a pre-COVID normal without a vaccine. And Deputy Chief Medical Officer Professor Paul Kelly said it's a balance between the economy and the virus, and that's something we need to live with for the period. And in fact, the economic damage continues. The Australian Bankers Association updated its loan deferral data for the 19th of June, which revealed that 779,458 loans have been deferred across Australia, including 
485,063 mortgages. And in value terms, that's $236.7 billion of total loans, including $175.6 billion of mortgages. According to the ABA, one in 14 mortgages are currently being deferred by Australia's lenders for up to six months. The huge number of loan deferrals continues to rise. And there are concerns, of course, about the cliff that is looming once the grace period is over. And APRA has received early release data submissions for the period ended the 14th of June for 177 funds. And over the period from the inception of the scheme on the 20th of April to the 14th of June, payments made to eligible members have taken on average 3.3 business days after receipt of the application from the Australian Tax Office and 95% have been made within five business days. Over the week to the 14th of June, superannuation funds made payments to a further 148,000 members, bringing the total number of payments to approximately 2.1 million since inception. And the total value of payments during the week was $1.3 billion, with $15.9 billion paid since inception. The average payment made over the period since inception was $7,486. And Mortgage Business reports that ING has lifted rates by up to 40 basis points across both its own occupied and investment home loan products amid cuts from its competitors. ING has hiked fixed mortgage rates by up to 20 basis points for own occupiers and up to 40 basis points for investors effective for new applications from the 19th of June. Unoccupied fixed rates now start from 2.19%, which is 3.79% comparison, while investor rates start at from 2.94% or 4.46% on a comparison rate basis. ING's rate heights come amid interest rate reductions from several of its competitors, including the big four banks, which have leveraged low funding costs to attract new business. And for example, last week, NAB reduced its fixed home loan rates by 15 basis points weeks out from the opening of the second phase of the first home loan deposit scheme. However, ING is not the only lender to lift fixed rates amid reductions with Newcastle Permanent, Teachers Mutual Bank and ANZ also hiking rates in recent weeks. Both ANZ and TMBL changes followed spikes in the bank's home loan volumes, with TMBL reporting a 300% increase in monthly applications. Mortgage business reached out to ING for a statement regarding its decision to hike rates, but the bank declined to comment. Meanwhile, heightened competition for high-quality unoccupied borrowers continues to trigger reductions in variable mortgage rates, particularly off the back of five 25 basis point reductions of the official cash rate over the past 12 months. According to recent APRA exposure statistics, mortgage rates have dropped from a weighted average of 4.2% in the March quarter of 2019 to a weighted average of 3.1%. But what of the longer term economic context? Well, this from Alan Kohler. The RBA's bond holdings represent only about 11% of the government debt, well short of what the Fed or the ECB and the Bank of Japan are doing. But it's also true that the RBA has effectively financed all of the JobKeeper program with new money. Is that bad? No, he says it's good. In fact, why should future taxpayers fund any of the 2020 pandemic rescue stimulus? That idea is based on the fallacy that the government is like a household or a business and that what it borrows must be paid back. What's the difference? Simply that a government issues its own money. Modern monetary theory or MMT, for that's what we're talking about here, does not suggest that the government has a magic pulling. In a new book on the subject called The Deficit Myth, economist Stephanie Kelton says, just because there are no financial constraints on the federal budget doesn't mean that there are no real limits to what the government can and should do. Every economy has its own internal speed limit regulated by the availability of our real productive resources. If the government tries to spend too much into an economy that's already running at full speed, Inflation will accelerate. There are limits, however. The limits are not on the government's ability to spend money or in the deficit, 
but in inflationary pressures and resource in the real economy. MMT distinguishes the real limits from delusional and unnecessary self-imposed constraints. And try this from the Grattan Institute. The coronavirus galvanised a public health response not seen in Australia for more than a century. To prevent its spread and disease, it causes COVID-19. Social and economic activity was shut down and Australia emerged with low numbers of deaths and a health system which coped with the outbreak. Australia's response passed through four phases, containment, reassurance amid uncertainty, cautious incrementalism, and then escalated national action as the gathering storm of the pandemic became more apparent. But they said, now we are in the fifth phase transition to a new normal. There are four key successes in the response. Cooperative government informed by experts, most notably seen in the establishment of the National Cabinet, closure of international borders and mandatory quarantine, rapid adoption and acceptance of social distancing measures, and expansion of telehealth. They say the health system mostly adapted well to the pandemic challenge. Governments rapidly prepared to expand intensive care unit capacity and redeploy staff and equipment to this new higher priority. Doctors and clinics pivoted quickly to telehealth, but unfortunately, there were also four key failures. The mishandling of the Ruby Princess cruise ship had fatal results. Borders weren't closed quickly enough. Some aspects of the health system response were too slow, and there were mixed messages about what was expected of the population. Now, Australia is in the fifth phase, a transition to a new normal, unless or until there's a vaccine, this stage has no end point. We will all live with the risks of more outbreaks and shutdowns and the need for vigilance and swift responses to outbreaks. Choices are being made about how and when the lockdown will be eased, with each state and territory taking a different path. While the virus continues to circulate, there will be a risk of a second wave. So in the report, they describe a model developed at the Grand Institute, which simulates the risks of different relaxation strategies. And they draw some lessons from the health system. They show that some strategies, such as reopening schools, involve some risks of outbreaks, but these outbreaks most likely can be controlled. And they highlight those strategies which are riskier, particularly reopening large workplaces. As those workplaces reopen, employers should be required to implement protocols to minimise transmission of the virus. This may require fewer people being at work at any one time, with staggered start and end times, and even staggered working days. And seven lessons from the health system response should be incorporated into a new normal, they said. Expand telehealth, expand hospital in the home, encourage outreach and telehealth with new primary care funding models. We start public elective surgery differently, including using private hospitals, improve health systems readiness by better planning and coordination, strengthen supply chains to ensure supplies of personal protective equipment and ventilators in the event of a second wave or new pandemic, and build better on the ground coordination. Planning for this transition is as important as the planning of the response during the initial wave of the pandemic. They said, without good planning for the transition, we risk a second wave and we risk not benefiting from the health system changes that occurred during the pandemic. That will be another tragedy on top of the trauma caused by the pandemic itself. And this from Moody's who says the coronavirus will shape and accelerate global economic, business and consumption trends. The coronavirus pandemic is a global crisis of historic proportions that will likely result in fundamental shifts in the way economies, societies and companies operate. While the exact pathway out of the crisis is unknowable at this point, with variables including the effectiveness of containment efforts and the success and timing of a vaccine development or treatments, the crisis will shape trends in six main areas, they say these trends have the potential for significant credit implications across both the public and the private sectors in the coming years. Long-term growth may weaken for many major economies. Even with substantial policy support, economies may not avoid lasting damage with a likely reduction in investment and potential increases in long-term unemployment. The economic disparity between emerging and advanced economies may widen. Interest rates will stay lower for longer 
and the current crisis is prolonging the extraordinary low interest rate environment, while the continuation of low rates will improve interest coverage in the near term. It will also perpetuate trends that have been apparent since the financial crisis, including looser credit availability and higher levels of public and private debt. Global trade will become more fragmented. The trend towards a more splintered and protectionist global economy will likely gain speed with competing economic blocks and new restrictions on trade, investment and technology transfers. Attitudes against globalisation will likely further harm. Changes in consumer habits will accelerate technology disruption. Some changes will likely be temporary, but others will be more permanent, such as reduced demand for office space, air travel, public transport, in-store shopping and on-site entertainment. In this new environment, the largest technology firms will have a clear advantage. Governments will have new social mandates. The role of government in society will likely magnify but rising inequality could result in a deterioration in social cohesion and reduce trust in institutions in some countries. More regulations are likely, particularly in areas viewed as vital for national security and self-sufficiency. Environment, social and government's risks will come into greater focus. With rising credit relevance, the pandemic experience will intensify the focus of companies, investors and other stakeholders on ESG factors, with scrutiny extending beyond public health crises to other issues with potential for high impact, such as climate change. So standing back, there is a fundamental philosophical divide here between health and wealth, and whether in fact you can trade one off against another. And that is, I think, a complex set of questions that will play out not over a few days or even weeks, but over the next two to five years. And economically, I think it's going to be very tough to see anything other than a long, slow grind, despite what the markets are signalling at the moment. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again in the next time.